So you think you know how cancer works. You think you know that cancer starts at, at a DNA level. And perhaps it's not that simple. Perhaps cancer begins in some other area of the cell called the mitochondria. Today, we talk to Dr. Nasha Winters, who is a global healthcare authority and the best-selling author of the book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. She is a consulting physician around the world. She has educated hundreds of professionals in clinical use of integrative and metabolic approaches to cancer, including the use of mistletoe, which we don't talk about today because we just didn't have the time. Dr. Winters is also currently focused on opening a comprehensive metabolic oncology hospital, and the most advanced integrative ther therapies will be offered there. The facility will be in a residential setting on a gorgeous campus, and it will serve as a backdrop of regenerative farming, EMF mitigation, and a retreat for those with cancer. So I'm excited about that with Dr. Winners. So today we talked a bit about, of course, what is the metabolic approach to cancer and what is the metabolic approach to prostate cancer? Might be a, a bit different than other cancers. Each cancer works differently. So then what do we do with that information? I am super excited with guest Dr. Nisha Winners, who is a colleague and a friend, and I'm super fortunate to know her and to know her work very well. Our conversation with the metabolic approach to cancer with Dr. Nisha winners. Let's go. Welcome to the Dr. Geo podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my intention, my goal, and my purpose to help you improve and optimize your prostate health and live better with the age. What a pleasure to have my friend and my colleague, Dr. Nisha Winners here. Nisha, I'm happy to have you on for a thousand reasons. I mean, it took us, what, 45 minutes to actually start recording? Right, right. <laughs> because it's like, oh, my God, we, it's catching up on everything that we're doing. And I love it when a patient comes to me and says, you know, I have this book on <laughs> metabolic type and cancer. I don't know if you know the book or you know the author. I was like, I know the book. And. I think I know the author. Um, and so it's so, um, an honor to when I have a patient that comes in with your with your book, which it will be on our show notes. Cool. General overview, the metabolic approach to cancer. We won't talk about prostate cancer yet. And maybe you can tell us how does let, let's start at a very basic level. Even I love basic things. And I kind of been doing what I do for a long time. I was like, how do we keep it simple? Perfect. Perfect. How does cancer even happen? <laughs> right. And what is the me metabolic approach to, to cancer? Uh, so you can go one and two, if you like, or it. take it however way you want to take it. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much. It's like you said, we spent 45 minutes beforehand, just like, oh. yay, <laughs> I'm just getting excited to be here with each other. And I'm really honored to be here as a, as a guest and hopefully share some things with your community, uh, which will be a lot of fun as well. But let me just start context for me is everything. Yeah. So what's very interesting is 1914, uh, Dr. Theodore Bovary is who sort of coined the concept of cancer as a genetic disease, a somatic mutation theory. And, and basically flash forward, you know, 110 years later, we are still sort of, you know, beating to that drum, to that drum. And that's where all of our research has gone, especially when we got a kind of a shot in the arm, when the DNA helix was found by Watson and Crick into the 1950s. And we really put all of our energy and sort of all of our all of our eggs in the basket of cancer is a genetic disorder. So that's, mm -hmm. and even today, that's where most of our- Period, end of story. Right, right, that's exactly. That's it. it. Yeah, done. It's like, there we are. That's it. And so <laughs> interesting, about the same time into the early 1920s, um, there was another researcher, Otto Warburg, that started to see that perhaps the genes wasn't the starting point. It's not to say the genes don't have some role in this, but there might be a, a few steps above 
you know, where the genes start to malexpress, if you will. Mm -hmm. And what he started to notice was sort of, again, accidentally, as it seems like all great things in science comes from accidents, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, he, he started to have this belief system because he was studying like urchin eggs, right? And, or, you know, the way they develop and had sort of this every belief system that it would proliferate in a particular way until it didn't. And so that's what kind of got him curious, digging a little bit deeper. And long story short, he was able to track back that the, the energy sources that um, cancer cells were using were different than the energy sources that healthy cells were using. Pretty simple, right? And so when we have healthy metabolism, our bodies are meant to be kind of a hybrid engine. We should easily be able to, in times of scarcity or times of excess, move easily back and forth from burning sugar or burning fat just as needed. And we evolved from that. You know, there was a reason why we evolved from that because we didn't always have a 7-Eleven on every corner available to you, right? Every night. That's so right. there was this cool kind of evolutionary reason why our body could go into different sources as needed. But with cancer cells, what was really curious is they kind of get stuck in one, mostly, I should say, we'll start that caveat there because we'll go down a, another path here in a moment. But for the most part, cancer cells get stuck in burning one major fuel source, which is glucose. Okay. And, and all of them will do that. All mm -hmm. cancer cells and all cancer types will really predominantly go for glucose. Some might also preferentiate to other fuels, but we'll come into that discussion a little bit later. So should we get into the yeah. prostate specific, but he was yeah. like, well, that's a curious thing. And so in looking at that, simply put, he took it down to even another level to realize even that was happening at the level of the mitochondria. And so most of us learned about mitochondria in sixth grade biology, about them being our factories of, you know, making powerhouse of the cell. You got it. Powerhouse of the cell, right? Yeah. I think everybody, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so we're like, oh, great. At the end of the day, you make ATP. That's what was important. Mm -hmm. Well, what he was learning about was this concept. In fact, one of his mentors was Kreb, as in the Kreb cycle mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. this in the biochemistry piece. But basically, at the end of the day, the cancer cells would default to this kind of primal fuel burning that was actually less efficient, ironically, than what healthy cells would do. So that's not so important of the story. What's important in the story is he recognized, wow, there's a lot of stuff happening at the level of the mitochondria, at the level of the way the body is using fuel in a cancering process versus using fuel in a healthy process. So that picked up some momentum. He actually won a Nobel Prize for it, I think 1931, 1932. But then it got kind of buried in the 50s when we started digging deeper into the helix. So that kind of just got... Guess, Why did that... Yeah, so I'm a little bit of a, his, yeah. in my mind anyway, a historian. Good. A couple of questions that I wonder if you know. Mm -hmm. 1920s or late 20s, he was a Jewish man in Germany. Was Hitler, was Hitler uh, incentivized to uh, help him with his research, though he was a Jew because his mother died from breast cancer? That's question number one. And number two, what was the relationship there with a Jew and Hitler, mm. if you know? Yep. And and why was it buried? Is it just yeah. political? Why was it buried? So I'll let you take it away. First of all, first of all there's a great book called Ravenous. And if you have not Ravenous. read it, Ravenous. And I cannot believe I can't think of the author's name right now. I can see his face, I can hear his voice, and I can see his book, and I've read it, and it's amazing. And it literally goes into the history here. But the fact that you've not read this book and know this piece, intuit to this piece, is just beautiful. Um, it just shows your historian type of brain and the asking of the right questions. That's also a sign of a good scientist, right? To be an observer. Thank you. And asking Thank you. I'll take it. I'll take whatever I can get these days. Okay. It's true. It's true. <laughs> but you're right. So there's. let's look at that time frame. Let's look at the early 1920s. We're moving now into World War II. We're moving now into a time where you just noted very specifically the Jewish Hitler dialogues, right? The other thing that was very interesting about that time is yes, you have Hitler and the rise of Nazism and all this piece here, but there's also an incredible terror about cancer. That there's an ethos within that time frame that everyone was very terrified of cancer and Hitler in particular because of exactly what you spoke to. So there was a personal experience with that, but there was also this commitment of, you know, they were very big into research. Oh God, we know how that played out, but, um, but they were very, very much wanting to solve the mystery of cancer and were terrified of it. So I always think homeopathically, they probably all could have used a dose of arsenic amalgam, you know, of just their <laughs> petrification of that. So, so there was that side of it. The other side to your question is how 
how did his fellow Jews handle him staying behind when the rest of them fleed or were murdered or, you know, whatever? It didn't go well, right? He was basically disenfranchised by his entire community and understandably so. I mean, he was considered a traitor to, you know, his, his Jewish culture. He was considered a traitor to the scientific minds. He was considered a traitor kind of globally because of that. But he was a pretty intense, as you will learn in his book, a pretty intense myopic individual who was absolutely honed in that this was going to be his claim to fame. And he did not mm. care the means of getting there. And that unfortunately burned a lot of bridges and likely set back the wisdom of his findings and his research mm. for decades. In fact, buried for decades, right? And so a lot of people will talk about maybe where this kind of rose up again, but I think I give a lot of credit to Dr. Thomas Seafried who really yeah. seemed to kind of dust off the research and reevaluate some things into the early 2000s to say, let's take a look at this again. Not that Dr. Otto Wargerberg had all the answers, but he certainly had some compelling questions that warranted mm -hmm. further investigation. And so one of the things I'd like to help people understand is, you know, in 1971, we claimed the war on cancer. And yet here we are 52 years later, and we've not really done a great I job. I was just born. I know. I was 71 also. That was my year. So oh, it was, yeah, you later. know, it was like Nixon, oh, right? Yeah, that's. Oof. Yeah. Did you look up your, did you ever look up the New York Times on the day that you were born or something? No, I, you know, I love when I see those things because there's always really yeah. cool stuff happening. Did you do that for yours? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I did. Tell me what it it was. was like the whole Nixon at the time. It was the all oh, the scandals with like Nixon. The Watergate, actually, when all I was that the, stuff. The Watergate. Yeah, yeah. Seventy <laughs> one was a trippy year. You know, I think you know finishing up Vietnam, um, everything with the Nixon administration, right. everything with the war on cancer and the redistribution of our research dollars and where we put our attention, and we kind of took a wrong turn in Albuquerque. You know, at that time, and mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. of our war on cancer was it was coming out of a, an ethos of war that the whole globe can understand. And so that was mm -hmm. sort of the thought process we took as well. And, and so I like to lay that ground. I love that this came up here because it actually is very important for any other conversations we're going to have here about like, what, what is cancer? Um, but first of all, one of the things that started happening is people like Dr. Thomas Seafried started to review the literature and even reproduce these, these studies themselves in the lab, mm -hmm. which was if this if cancer is in fact a genetic disease, there's a very simple study known as the nuclear transfer cell studies, okay? Nuclear transfer studies, which is basically where we take the hard drive, the, the container within the cells that contains all the genetic material, okay? The nuclei. And mm -hmm. you would remove that nuclei from a healthy cell and you would replace the nuclei of a cancer cell with that healthy nuclei. If this was a genetic disease, you would theoretically turn that cancer cell back into a healthy cell. And the opposite was true is if you took the hard drive, the, the genetic material of that nuclei from a cancer cell and you replaced the nuclei of a healthy cell, you should, if this is a genetic disease, turn this into a cancer cell. That did not happen. And it's never happened. And it won't happen because it's not just a genetic disease. And that we also understand that our genetic signalings are coming from external to that nuclei in and out. And that's where people started getting curious. And so one of my mm. heroes is Mina Bissell, who in the mm. 1980s, she started really doing research and talking about this extracellular matrix. And that mm -hmm. that's where the magic's happening. We might today, you and I might call it the, the, the tumor microenvironment. That's my word, but I think your word is the terrain. The terrain is where I like to call it. And so, That's right. and so it's like, what is that cell floating in? What is that mitochondria floating in? What is that nuclei floating in? Suddenly we went away from that kind of myopic view of here's where the problem is in the DNA here inside this nuclei to a more global perspective of, oh, interesting. There's a lot of interesting signaling communication happening outside of that. And one of the components of that is how the body is producing and utilizing energy at that mitochondrial level, which is what brought the kind of curiosity back for people like Dr. Seafried to say, hmm, that's interesting. Let's take a look at this deeper. So fast forward. So maybe cancer, maybe cancer is a mitochondrial disease. Exactly. And that's where a lot of the data is even today coming more and more forthright with that. You can, it's funny because, you know, chat GPT only goes through at 2021, unless you get the updated versions. If you even Google, mm -hmm. what's the difference between somatic mutation theory and mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer, even in two years, 
like they're still missing a lot of the data we have in the last two years. That there's, and I love to give the example that one of my heroes, he doesn't know it yet, but I stalk him regularly is Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. I love the book, Emperor of All Maladies. Love it. I mean, it's excellent. It's excellent book. Beautiful and intense. But you know, if you read this book, he finishes at the end of the book, basically still saying, this is a, this is a genetic disease, right? Then he's he, called, he wrote a paper on the New Yorker, I want yes. to say. On the on the on the environment on the terrain on the and it, I, I still use it. I was like, no way. I mean, I had I wanted to cry. I did. This I is did a, cry. a New York, <laughs> <laughs> but you're new. World it. renowned. Yep, he walked. He drank <laughs> the terrain Kool Aid. I like to say. Yeah, that's right. He that's came right. From that world, and yet he himself tried to disprove the mitochondrial metabolic approach. So his next book was actually called The Gene. That's right. It was like trying to kind of still like kick that can down the road a little bit further. Right. And <laughs> his colleagues like Vogelstein and, you know, right. these guys still saying, oh, cancer is just a genetic roulette and it's just bad luck. Like he was trying to toe that line. Right. His light, latest book, The Cell, it's it's beautiful. I mean, talk about crying. I, I, I What a writer. Exactly. I, I, I read his books and I'm first of all, there's an element. I'm like, Gio, you suck as a writer. <laughs> Makes you know I mean, right like, to read his up, up your game. <laughs> but there's also this like, wow, I can write better because I just read this book. Totally. And, and this, I, you know, more, more with more clarity, yeah. better sequence, more in a more elegant, yes. more elegant way. That's yeah. beautiful. And he's, he's a storyteller. And he, that's why I yeah. even love the name of his book, the first book, The Biography of Cancer, right? Improbable Amount. It's like, Unbelievable, he's yeah. telling the story of this. And he's also in that book, for those who haven't read it, it's juicy. It's over a thousand pages. Um, so we'll talk about my Cliff's Notes version. I'd recommend instead if you want to still or curious. But he, he tells the story about the history of cancer and about sort of like what we think cancer is. And he was still kind of holding on at the end of the book to say it's a genetic disorder. His, you could almost watch his process, his mind you know, set change in the last few years. And to your point, when that article came out in the New Yorker, I, I literally, it's one of my favorites to refer. I think that was 2017 or 18. Yep. It was 2017 or 18. I can't remember exactly. Oh, beautiful to see like there was this epiphany for him. And in fact, today he is one of the most renowned researchers in metabolic mitochondrial, what we call metabolic oncology today. And he even yeah. owns like he actually owns shares in some companies that are testing in this arena and looking at, at metabolomics and, and how to target these things. I mean, this man talk about witnessing someone's evolution in real time glorious and i have such respect for him to absolutely and he, the beauty is he also didn't like throw away the genetics he's like the genetics have a role but we have that the controller of those genetics is what's happening at that mitochondrial metabolic level and what i like about him is what many people have said about me is that geo you know i hope you don't run for politics you'll be a horrible politician <laughs> and i took it as a compliment right off the bat. Totally, totally and he's they say you you change your mind mm. You tend to change your mind. I said, I absolutely do. Yes, you do. If I got it wrong some years ago, right. I want to change my mind. Thank you. And I want to get it right, not be right. right. Yes. This is exactly what uh, Siddhartha has, has done. Nailed it. Nailed it. And that's so beautiful. That's exactly it. Because I think any clinician who's been in practice for longer than five years will definitely eat crow at some point in their time, in their career and should. Yeah. Because yeah. we're learning things always. And if you're still practicing the way you were originally taught or the way you were five years ago, 10 years ago, you probably need to retire or look at another career because <laughs> that's right. Right. I mean, our, yeah. our fields yeah. are exploding. Like I said, even chat GPT of missing data from 2021 to today, two years later, the yeah. explosion right now, I think there's just right now, if you went on PubMed and you typed in ketogenic diet and cancer, for instance, there's over 620 current clinical trials. Right. I mean, it's just one Amazing. example. And then what that segues into is where people like Seafried and others who've come along, researchers like Dr. Adrian Sheck, Dr. Richard Fry, Dr. Don Agostino, a lot of the folks in this sort of metabolic health space in general that got sort of pushed into the oncology space because it's 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 just where funding and their research has taken them. They started to realize you can manipulate the behavior of that mitochondria, of that shifted metabolic, what they call the metabolic drift, or that that mm -hmm. place where you have this aberrant energy utilization now. 
in a cancering process, which behaves very differently and very distinctly from a healthy cancer, from a healthy cell, right? And so that's where folks get really confused is you realize you've got two parallel journeys happening simultaneously. You may have cancer or cancer tumor or cancer tumor cells or even cancer metabolic pathways, but it's still floating within this beautiful <laughs> entirety organism that's healthy cells, right? Or still listening cells. And so you have to be able to treat for both of them simultaneously. And that's where people like Dr. Gio and myself come forth in that we might also have to learn and become tumor experts. Do we have to know what we need to know about that environment and about what our colleagues in standard of care know? But we also have to be experts in the terrain and that extracellular matrix or that tumor micro environment to know how to enhance a patient's response to any therapy at any given time. I love it. Thank you for thank you for that. That, that was so beautifully said and, and and so important to give that context. Yeah. So then what do we do? How do we, how do we turn these bad cells off um, in a and, and, and let's see, I, I, I know that the approach or at least the approach, according yeah. to your knowledge and expertise is some level of supporting the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. You know, when people read this, they, you know, or hear about this, they're like, I'm eating no sugar. Right. I'm eating and, and no carbohydrates and things like that. Some go on a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned, Nisha, and again, I only see prostate cancer. Right, so right. let's keep that in mind. Yes, I mean, when people yes. say, no, I did ketogenic diet because this guy Seafree did some research. Yeah. So yeah, that was glioblastoma. Right. And yeah. and and that's a bit very different biologically and metabolic metabolically. The other component is again, I've done ketogenic yeah. diets. I prescribed it initially in my practice years ago. And you know, staying on it, not easy. I've seen a lot of people on ketogenic diet where the lipids go really, really LDL. So the cardiovascular risk, I don't know if it's higher necessarily, but their LDLs and their, you know, their, their bad cholesterol, APOB goes really high, right? And some of them are, they respond differently. Right. I think they're doing research to see if that really matters from, so in other words, not to completely digress, but you have a very high APOB, you have a very high LDLC, you do a calcium score or some yeah. sort of CTA and it comes out zero, right. you know, there's no, yeah. no, no, no right. plaque. Right. And so like, wait a minute. So what, what do we do now? Do yeah. we, do we have it all wrong with our biomarkers? Is it, so that's an area that's being investigated yeah. right now. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, like my good cardiologist uh, friends that are very integrative and open-minded is said, geo, I give them a statin because I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know. And that and it's more of an, I don't know scenario. Yeah. Now, now we, we keep digressing and say, oh, well, statin is not good for the, not good for the mitochondria. Right. Like, you know, there's a certain group of drugs that are not good. Mito so it's like, wh yeah. what do we do with all this sure. and how do we make it um, so that people can actually apply some sort of method? I like fasting, for example. Yes. So for me in prostate cancer, prostate cancer is, I, I guess we'll talk about that oh, is, is more lipogenic, less glycolytic and so but i still believe in the power of of of, of ketones right right in the yes. so my method as opposed to a high fat diet because i'm afraid that in prostate cancer it may not be good for prostate cancer patients yeah. but we can still get the same result through some level of fasting i said a lot no you take it away in whatever direction you, you want you like it so take. beautifully first of all i want to just like thank you for someone out there understanding that the ketone bodies aren't the problem, it's the method of getting into ketosis that may not yeah. be the best fit for that for a pair for a prostate cancer. I, I think yeah. honestly, Gio, you're the first and probably only person who's made that connection. And so Oh. Hella freaking Lou, yeah, is all I just want to say right there. <laughs> okay. Listen, if I don't know a couple of things by now on prostate cancer, I'll right. close shop and close my practice <laughs> and go bartend. You, right. Over there in Mexico, by the here way. Here you go. Come on down with us here. <laughs> this is what's really good. Is so even so even on I think it's like page ninety one of my book when it came out in two thousand seventeen, the metabolic approach to cancer. We were even saying, you know, studies suggest that maybe this isn't the best and specifically therapeutic ketogenic diet, meaning high fat low carbohydrate, moderate to low protein diet specific yeah. for prostate cancer. We were speaking about that in the book. And it's like I, every prostate patient with prostate cancer, whoever reads that book, they see that, they highlight it, they send me a message like, oh, am I killing myself? I'm like, wait a second, let's talk about how you're eating. So let's put that, that's one component. The other component is you alluded to a lot of things around people's sort of genetics, you know, like so into the epigenetics, the, the familial tendencies, the single nucleotide polymorphisms. 
those can give me clues as to who is a good candidate for a high fat, low carb diet or not. Right. Or even people who are a good candidate for a vegetarian diet or a carnivore diet or not. So we can even go deeper into what diet might have been genetically matched best for that patient that might be helpful at any given time. And then, of course, you talked about different metrics that we could test through, you know, like calcium scores and and even other lab testing that you and I do a plethora of because we do like to look at the data. We're data driven here. So that's really important. So I want people to know that we take all of that information into context and we are not prescriptive or protocol driven in any form or fashion. What I would like to say, and you brought this up so beautifully, is that there are many roads to Rome to create metabolic flexibility. So when we talked about a healthy system in the beginning of this conversation, we talked about that we should be dual engines, that our body should be able to like go into burning glucose, burning fat very easily, very sustainably, very efficiently, you know, at need when the, when the resources are low in any department, right? But when cancer comes on, even if it's, it has, even if there are certain cancer types that might utilize things like proteins, like glutamine or arginine or methionine, which can happen in certain ways. And I'll talk about that. Amino in acids. Uh, that these way. are amino acids that create proteins. Exactly. Or if there are some that are lipophilic, like you said, that like the fats. So um, there are definitely certain breast cancer types that may suggest that in cell line studies, for sure. Prostate cancer um, cell line studies suggest this. I have had a few experiences in clinical to see that I think a high fat diet wasn't a good fit for my patient with prostate cancer. So I've, I've, I tend to be a bit more um, conservative there, even if I know that ketones aren't a problem. So I'm with you. On if that. I may, for a second, if you look hard enough at the literature, like I have with prostate cancer, yeah. of course, is like everything is bad for prostate cancer. So right. I, eggs, you know, certain, many amino acids, eggs and choline. Yeah. Yeah. Choline, which you need for many life, life. brain functions yeah. to live. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. How about that? How about to live? Yeah. A few amino acids. Uh, many of my friends, uh, my friend, my patients are don't want to take. You know, so they want a low protein. But right. as they get older, yeah. uh, now they need more muscle for, to be functional and not to have metabolic problems, yep. so forth. Carbohydrates, you know, also problems. So I think that the I think that the deal is mostly so. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Gia, what's the dietary protocol? Yeah. Well, there's levels. Yes. Yeah. Let's start with eat. Let's start with eat 50% less and eat until you're 80% full. Love what it. do I eat? Cool. I don't care at this point. Right. Eat 50% right. less right. until you're 80% full. Yeah. And then we could start going into the weeds a little right. bit more. Yeah. Depending how your metrics are, are guiding us. Yeah, that's right. right. You know, that's just it is that we're not guessing. We're not throwing people on these things. And so one of the strategies that I have seen is so a lot of people think, oh, so ketogenic makes people forget that it's a it's a physiologic state ketosis is a physiologic state and you right. can achieve ketosis just by carbohydrate restricting or caloric restricting as you just alluded yeah. to you can achieve ketosis as a carnivore you can achieve ketosis is a high fat low carb diet which is considered a therapeutic ketogenic diet which came to light in the 1920s used for epilepsy and pediatrics at heart Harvard, Harvard, Harvard. Every time I say that, I want to say Harvard or Hopkins, my brain, one of the H's in the 19th. One of the H's. Apologies for that. That's it towards the end of the day here. Um, but you can also achieve a therapeutic ketosis and a keto, a ketosis state with fasting. And so that is when I end up looking at cancer types on cell line studies and in, in the literature, and you start to go crazy of like, you're pretty much going to live on distilled water and cardboard to avoid all the things. That's where a little bit of caloric restricted, time restricted eating and fasting, not even worrying about the what so much. I love that you just brought that up, has massive utility, massive utility. And it is literally starving all the potential fuel sources. And so what's funny is up until the 1960s, fasting was probably the most utilized dietary approach in cancer patients until someone got it in their head in the 1960s that how dare we take something away from these poor people. And we mm. got to just feed them. Let's just load them up. Let's get them on some insure while we're at it. Maybe some boost. You know, it sounds like my mom, right? Cuban mom. And <laughs> if she saw me lose two pounds, oh, yeah. you're like, oh, uh, yeah, oh keep Mind open. Job. But I'm full, yeah, mom. I'm <laughs> open wide. Rice and beans. Op open. Totally. You got to keep eating. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So she wanted always to see me nice and chunky. Yeah. And so we do like, and the, the, the advice all of our patients are given is don't, no matter what, don't lose weight. But I'm telling you right now, guys, less than so less than 6.8% of people in the United States specifically 
this is where the studies are, likely this applies to all of our globalized, you know, westernized communities around the globe, but less than 6.8% of us are metabolically healthy, which means mm -hmm. that I don't care if you even look a little skinny on the outside. There's a plant. There are a lot of toffees walking on this planet. Then on the outside, fat on the inside. We can't know by I looking agree. at somebody, right? If they're too yeah. fat, too thin, you can't know that. You have to look at other metrics. So you can do body impedance testing because a mm -hmm. BMI is BS. You can mm -hmm. do like even on like cachexia, for instance. I lecture a lot about this and I teach patients about this because that fear that the doctor seeds and they're like, no matter what, don't lose weight. I'm like, skinny. Eat whatever different. you want. Just keep eating. Eat whatever you want. Ooh, that, Sneak, Snickers advice. bars don't matter. Worst advice yeah. there. And so when we start to lose um, some weight, what we see is someone's actually moving into a metabolic state of weight loss, which is bad, right? This is cachexia, which happens like in stage heart disease, in stage HIV and AIDS, in stage cancers. There are certain conditions in stage mm -hmm. COPD where you get what's known as sarcopenia or cachexia, mm -hmm. where you start to lose all your muscle mass. And you start to see, you can kind of see the, the, the gauntness showing up and maybe the really skinny arms and legs and kind of poochy belly. That is a metabolic state that is not going to be responsive to any amount of calories. And the irony about that metabolic state is it's driven by carbohydrates. So it's an inflammatory process. So it's a cytokine driven inflammatory process that is fueled by insulin. Okay. And so the worst thing we can give to a patient in this state is things like boost and ensure, right? It's, and then to tell them to go out and have, eat whatever they want, eat as much of it they want. It actually fuels the process faster. So weirdly, what freaks people out is in our world under medical supervision, we're watching them closely. We've actually had better success fasting people to get them out of cachexia than feeding people to get them out of cachexia, which is a weird. Well, that's a fascinating point right there. Honestly, in even I, in, with somebody who's cachectic, I would, I would hesitate to put them on a fast. Yeah. And now you just said that they will not, yeah. they would not, they would do better if they fast, uh, if they were cachectic. Because yeah. you're dropping the insulin, you're kicking up the ketone bodies, which themselves are protective of muscle mass. And mm -hmm. you're also dropping the inflammatory markers. And so when wow. you pair that with, you add in MCT oil, you add, add in things that will boost the ketone bodies even further, you get them into a little bit of movement, a little bit of exercise. These patients turn around, I can turn them around within a matter of weeks. Now, again, this is very medically guided. We're looking at labs and what we're looking for in the labs is to make sure their serum protein and their serum albumin are both well within my optimal ranges. We want the serum protein above seven and the serum albumin above four. If both of them drop below those numbers, I know they're in stage one cachexia. And then we become a little more aggressive. If they're in like a stage one cachexia, that's where you want to kick up the protein maybe, right? That's where you might um, have them be a little more physically active. But when they start to move into stage three and four cachexia, in stage three and four cachexia, that's where standard of care says you have less than three months to live. And so at that point, we don't have time to mess around. And so in a very highly medicalized environment, we can turn this around very quickly and stabilize. And we've been collecting the data on that. We hope to... to report on that, but colleagues of ours have done a lot of research in the field of cachexia and where a therapeutic ketosis, not necessarily in a high fat, low carb, but a high fat, if people can tolerate the high fat, low carb, that's really great because you're getting in all the calories as well. But with prostate, to your point, Gio, we have to be a little more mindful because it does have some good literature that suggests that the high fat diets could be problematic for these cancer types. And so we can, to your point, get them on carb restriction along yeah. with like a very Mediterranean heavy, sort of more, yeah. very much more plant Absolutely. dense, play with the protein levels dependent on where they are in their life cycle. Like if they're, you know, like you said, yeah. if they're a 60, 75 year old man, they need to, they need to muscle routine, you know? And if they are on androgen deprivation therapy. Completely will change things so, up. Yeah. They, you know, I have them on whey protein and I want muscle already. So there's three ways of keeping muscle, right? Right. Is yeah. is Blues stress, it. stressing yeah. the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are um, certain amino acids like yeah. branchain and, and yeah. leucine primarily. Yeah. And there is testosterone. Yeah. You remove testosterone. I need a lot of the other two. Yeah. You and that's usually the, the conversation with with those, with those patients. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh, so in a, in a higher stage, 
cachectic scenario, yeah. again, the, the serum levels of protein will be much less than seven yeah, and, albumin. and albumin would be and less than you'll four. you'll start to see the creatinine drop and the calcium drop. And when you see calcium serum, creatinine, protein, and albumin, all four are low, you know the patient's in, in stage cachexia. And that's where it right. takes literally with our patients, we get their family, we get their caregivers, we get their medical team on board to say, you're setting an alarm for every, every 15 minutes, you're putting something in your mouth of protein or fat every 15 minutes. And every hour you're taking a teaspoon to a tablespoon of to what's tolerated of MCT oil and or high doses of fish oil, because we're trying to stop that cytokine storm and we're trying to realize the, the metabolic shift that's happening. We can often turn that around, like I said, within a matter of days to a couple of weeks, and it's hard because what happens in cachexia, you lose your appetite. So a lot of times sure. we'll encourage people to also utilize medical marijuana in that time to help with uh, stimulate appetite. If they are- Get the uh, munchies. Yeah, get them the munchies, but make sure they're <laughs> stocked with the right kind of munchies. Like we make a lot of like- uh, Keto donuts? Are keto <laughs> donuts and keto ice cream part of the- At that point, <laughs> we say yes, because at that point, if we <laughs> okay. can ketify things that sound good- you know, like, yeah. good, like make sure we still carbohydrate restrict. That's the key. And that I want to come back to when you, you talked about using whey, I would love for you to look at maybe using a, a different form because whey will kick up insulin and insulin growth factor in those folks. And so even though probably, from, from, from uh, using protein eventually as, as glucose. Well, but, in, but whey in particular. Gluconeogenesis. Yes. Yeah. Whey and way more particular than any of the other once you just rattled off. And so, you know, if there's another protein powder that you like, like a collagen based or something, we often will use that instead just to mitigate that insulin piece because prostate does still get pushed by insulin and insulin growth factor. So you still want to mm -hmm. carb restrict in that department, but you don't want to fat load these patients. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and what fats you do. Interesting. Them, so yeah. with weight, so I'm interested in yeah. primarily I'm interested in leucine. Yeah. Right. So sometimes I tell them, look, just take brine chain amino acids yeah. and creatine, yeah. actually, and, yeah. and creatine to keep muscle. The whey component, um, that's a that's a grim. I have to look into that. That's a, that's a great point. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up, because I've been playing. around. Of course, I did plant proteins yeah. for a while. I was yeah. like, this, just like right. not, not enough leucine and, yeah. and or the important yeah. um, protein synthesis, amino acids. And right. And, and plant-based proteins. But it's interesting because, you know, you, because oh, there's also that worry about the choline, what one, one choice you could use, which will help your patients would be the egg white powder yeah, or just egg whites. Right. So if there's concerns, right. again, I, I don't know. I've, I, I remember when all, everyone was kind of freaking out about choline and I pulled all my patients off of choline. I don't, I didn't see a difference. I don't know. Do you, what tell me, do you, do you see a difference? I mean, I don't you know, like supplement them. It's so things. difficult to see a difference with the addition of one thing or the removal Agreed. of one thing in Agreed. patients, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know. I can't yeah. say. What I can say is when that? there's a lot of literature yeah. pointing in what direction, I cannot ignore it. Exactly. And it's almost like it's almost like across the board. Agreed. The literature. We can talk. I mean, I don't yeah. think like, glutamine and things like that are not all saying the same thing. I think I, I look at the preponderance of yeah. research there, like I do with everything else with choline and eggs, yeah. whether it's a pers prospective studies right. or uh, human studies or uh, preclinical, it's all in that. So it's like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I know we need choline. Yeah. So I'm not going to have you ne not to take much choline, right. but I think there's, there's a poisonous dose out there um, of which I'm not yet a hundred percent familiar with what that is. So let's get you off the eggs. Cause I know you're going to get it from other sources. Right. And that's where sometimes like in those patients, when I have prostate cancer patients who are severely cachectic, which is really rare by the way, in that patient type, you know, that it cachexia is not a common unless it's very, 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 very in stage. In that time, right. you'll, you'll see it with, with things like pancreatic, ovarian, you know, lung cancers, things like that are, have a higher propensity to move into that cachexia space. So we don't have to be as concerned, but I really like your strategies of like use it or lose it on the muscle mass, like make sure we are engaging that. And, and this is where I think some of the most underutilized tools for us is exercise. And I know you're a huge proponent of that, Gio. Like I love your videos when you're out there working out. I, and, I didn't even and, know you're watching. But Thank I, you. I'm a total stalker. What, what are you talking about here? It's all good. You know, but these are the things like we, so back to kind of like the big picture, what do we do here? And that's where, when we think about the mitochondria in general, okay. And when we start about what can we do, you have to remember your mitochondria are like these little sensing agents. Like I just sort of mm -hmm. imagine like float around out there, you know, on the cytoplasm of the cell, mm -hmm. they're taking in information. They're taking mm -hmm. in through food, 
they're taking in through light. They have these cool things called cytochromes, you know, and I'm, you know, you, I'm preaching the choir here, but maybe your listeners don't know this. They're like, yeah. kind of like little, Please, yeah. you're like solar panels, right? They're taking in yeah. specific frequencies of light. So colors of light, they're very sensitive to that, which is also how we can harness and use light to treat these things, by the mm -hmm. way, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool, but they can also be very easily harmed by light, such as screen time that you and I are standing here mm -hmm. talking to each other from all the blue light that's coming <laughs> from that, right? Or lack of nature time lack of the green spectrum, lack of the red spectrum from like sunrise, sunsets, et cetera. So if you're the average American and you're spending less than 15 minutes outdoors, you're not getting that beautiful, important, you know, full spectrum of light that is landing in those mitochondria cytochromes to help things move along more efficiently and effectively. Mitochondria are also taking in information of the food, the water, the air, both quality and toxicity of those things. And interesting, we also have interesting studies like we can use, a, there's a technology out there called the seahorse, not to be confused with what floats around the ocean, but it's a way mm. to measure the respiratory chain of the mitochondria. So I also tell patients, I explain to them, it's like when cancer comes a knocking, it's like the mitochondria stop breathing, they kind of separate, mm. right? And then they kind of get, you know what happens when you... Can't catch, you get a little desperate, right? You get a little resourceful. You mm -hmm. start to like go crazy looking for other means. It's like what's mm -hmm. happening in our cancer cells. So it's taking in information. It's taking in information even of like who you're spending time with, what you're doing or not doing with your life. Are you in harmony with the circadian rhythm of your life, with the people in your life, with the seasons of your life? So your mitochondria are the sensing agent. And then they take in that information and they use that information to help churn out more signaling pathways. In fact, we think that they just make ATP. That's just one thing. They also are in charge of apoptosis. So mitochondria, when you don't have enough functioning mitochondria, you don't kill cancer. You don't die. So here it is. We have... And ironically, many other drugs out there and the pharmaceuticals and things, not only for cancer, but for yeah. other diseases... Yeah. They, they do damage to uh, mitochondrial health. Which also just shows me the power of the resilience of us, because honestly, we should all be working, walking around like no mitochondria, right? <laughs> like, it's like so sad, like, oh my God. Zombies, we should all be zombies kinda, walking around. Kinda. And it's like in that, so what's also cool is they can be, they can have the crap beaten out of them and they can lose function, but they're also very resilient and can come back easily. So you talked about like, mm -hmm. how do we make the happy mitochondria? How do we make the sad mitochondria? So if you're constantly like, going to in and out Burger and lathering mm. up, you know, you know, phthalates all over your skin and you're having your clothes dry cleaned and using dryer sheets and you're sitting on your brand new flame retardant couch and you're sitting in traffic for three hours of your commute every day, huffing everyone's benzene and, you know, and you're, you're in a toxic marriage, you're in a toxic work environment, you're not getting out in nature and moving your body and you're then feeding it crap on the run and there's zero mindfulness and you're up late watching Netflix just to cope with life. And you're you know, like, do you see what I'm saying? Like that, mm. unfortunately, I just described probably 80 to 90% of Western civilization. And I can't believe the walk, like you said, I can't believe the people, I mean, the body is the most resilient Agreed. mechanism in yeah. existence. Yeah. I can't believe people now the quality of how they're walking around. That's another conversation, yeah. but they're walking around, yes. uh, you know, despite, yes. despite of all that. Yeah. Hey, now, Nisha, do yeah. you do you have patients test for their ketones with strips? Yes, Is that part of the? We do. We start yeah. when someone's completely naive to a carbohydrate restricted lifestyle or keto ketosis lifestyle. We have them start with cheap, you know, off Amazon ketone dipsticks. So they check their ketones first thing in the morning on their. Any product. brand that you like? Golly, any of them. Whatever's on whatever's on sale on Amazon. Mm -hmm. or it's your Rite Aid, right? Um, it's not about accuracy as much as it's about see, see progress. Exactly. Because the first, you're kind of looking at a spectrum. They'll basically show low, moderate, or high. So what you're doing in the beginning when you start this is I advise patients to start to work with like, you, this is where I talk to them in the office. I say, hey, are you comfortable fasting for 13 hours a day? Meaning you finish dinner at 7 p.m. and you don't break your fast until 8 a.m. Nothing but water, maybe black coffee or black tea, nothing in it. You'd be surprised at how many people can't do that. It's, it's pretty shocking because you're like, no. I can't func I can't function without food in the morning. Right. 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 I can't, I need breakfast. Right. And so people, and I say, well, you can have the breakfast, but can you extend it a little bit later? Cause if we can get everyone back to a routine of at least 13 hours fasting every day, everyone, 
we, if you're in a healthy metabolic state, you should be showing trace ketones on morning urine strips after a 13 hour fast. Is that your, your magic number? Is it 13 hours? That is my magic number, but it's a magic number. I learned from a lot of colleagues in this research space and we, and people who've done like the test of like, okay, do we have ketones at nine hours and looking at people's, you know, macronutrients, looking at people's diet diaries, looking at those things and going, okay. And it's, it doesn't seem to matter what that person's diet was, but somewhere around hour 13, we start to release some ketones in someone who's got some metabolic flexibility. So somewhere and they say, and, and, and so are we releasing ketones after the 13th hour for a half hour for an hour until we eat? And does that matter? Yes, that's a great question. So once you eat, depending what you eat, if you go and have a high carb meal, you're going to kill those ketones right off. Right. But if you go and you have like, you know, a meal that's predominantly fat or a meal that's very carb restricted and maybe a little bit of protein or just like really high, uh, like above the ground leafy vegetables, you know, um, so like sauteed greens and an egg, if you can do eggs or like sauteed greens and leftover fish from the night before with a lot of olive oil would be like a great way to break your fast. That will actually keep pumping those ketones. Mm. And how about exercise? Ah, So, so exercise, uh, you know, exercise on an empty stomach with only, you know, fluids and, and, and is, does that promote more ketones and do you keep, you keep building or creating more ketones as a result of that? How does that work? I love that question. So my husband's like the living lab for this. So he does not eat anything until he gets up in the morning. He always has, you know, he's probably more of a 15 to 16 hour faster every day, just just by nature, but he always gets in a good hardcore um, paddleboard session. And he goes out for like an hour, hour and a half. And mm-hmm. his ketones, well, he'll be basically trace ketones on blood. So, you know, he's at the point where once you, once you become metabolically flexible, you shouldn't be showing ketones in your urine anymore. Now your body should be utilizing them appropriately. And that's when you graduate to the blood testing. So he'll do his blood ketones before going out just to see what they're doing. And then he'll go for a paddle and come back in a fasted state. His ketones will suddenly be like two or three, like they're gorgeous. And then Mm. he'll have, you know, he likes to have like something high protein, high fat, you know, for breakfast at that point, we'll break it and he'll actually pop up a little bit more. So his Mm. body has gotten into this like tuned thing. And this is a man, I want your listeners to know that when we met, he was a pro triathlete who both of us were vegans and Mm. he was probably eating, I don't know, five to six potatoes, like big baked potatoes a day, big buckets of sure. rice, all the rice and beans you could possibly imagine. He sure. was stick thin. He had like little chicken legs. He was so adorable. Like just these little like gangly chicken legs. He weighed 172 pounds at six foot, almost six foot four, you know, like mm-hmm. just a skin. He's now 53 and like this buff dude who never works out except for his power, his paddle board five days a week. Right. Mm. And he's more fit now because he's giving his body the right fuel and he doesn't over exercise either. And if he did now, his choice would be to get in the gym and do weight training. Because mm. at this point, like cardio almost killed him. Like it mm. webbed him up so hard. Like his, yeah. as it does with most directly. endurance athletes. Exactly. Yeah. And he was hardcore and it just destroyed him. And so changing from a carbohydrate high diet and a cardiovascular workout lifestyle to one that's more carb restricted, higher fat, because it works well in his body um, with less, you know, like more like hit type of training and just regular movement, like day-to-day movement. He's in better shape at 53 than he was at 23. Right. And so I, 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 I can empathize with that for sure. Right. With not only myself, but many people that are right. under my care. I bet because it's like, I think we somehow think we have to push ourselves and a lot of our patients are actually causing themselves some disservice by going, like getting on the, you know, the elliptical for three hours or whatnot. And, and like, how do do less is more in that arena? You can do so much more. So specifically for men, people like Dr. I love Dr. Wilson's faster size. Right. Mm-hmm. So this yep. for, so for like my link that up. Yeah, I love him. And I love this book because if I have men who are trying to maintain or create muscle mass, have them doing these short little burst workouts fasted, you guys grow muscle. You're kind of jerks. I'm just going to say it like it's not fair <laughs> that it happens so fast. This is way more particular to the men physiology than the female physiology. Yeah. Women get a yeah. little bit out of it, but you guys really get a big bang for your buck. So even yeah. having your patients say, okay, I'm going to fast. I'm going to get up at 12 hours. I'm going to go do my workout. So I'll be in a, you know, in a fasted state already. And then I can still break my fast an hour later after a workout with something that's not carb heavy. 
your patients right there would probably see so much benefit on so many factors because that also, guess what, pops the tea naturally without it being the tea that's going to cause problems for their cancer. Absolutely. Yeah. The other component is that if you do that kind of workout and you have some sort of good quality protein that has the branching amino After acids break, within right? two hours, yeah. within two hours, roughly, okay. it, it really stimulates muscle, uh, muscle based on, based on studies. So, and so, what yeah. do we know about muscles? Muscles are the storage units for very, very healthy mitochondria. Right. And so building that muscle mass is actually really desired to build new, new, healthier mitochondria that will scooch out those less healthy mitochondria and encourage the apoptosis of cells that are no longer serving you well. And so I think that it's just this beautiful, elegant dance. And I think that naturopathy and functional medicine, looking at the whole being like, what are you ingesting? And that's even down to the media, not just down to your food and water <laughs> and so to your day-to-day -day experiences, right? Those are things that are creating that swimming pool for your cells. And that's going to be the signaling agents that tell your cells to grow baby, grow in the wrong ways or you know, grow baby, grow in the right ways. So growing the right kind of muscle mass to store new, healthier mitochondria or relinquish those unhealthy cells that were trying to grow tumors, right? This is the beauty and the elegance of a metabolic approach, which I also feel for me intuitively is just more hopeful than this yeah. genetic Russian roulette of your screwed. Quality of life is also so much better. You know, this constant decline after a cancer diagnosis, yeah. it's just, it's just very sad to see yeah. again. And I, I'm very happy to say that many, if not well, most of my patients actually after a, well, the, I, we start, well, we call them thrivers, mm -hmm. not survivors. Yes. I love that. Thank you. They're thrivers and they literally do better. Mm. It's like, congratulations, man. High five. Yeah. You got prostate cancer. Yeah. Now you get to live your best life moving forward. I love that. I don't know if you don't need some conventional treatment yeah. at, depending on the scenario. Oh, I love act. I love Gleason six prostate cancer. <laughs> Cause you're like on oh, that teeter totter the, of like, Oh, that's the best. We can totally do this on our own. <laughs> you, you're not going to die from right. prostate cancer, but you got diagnosed. Right. These guys are ready. Right. Right. And they don't need treatment. Yeah. Right. These are, these are, these are, but even guys with Gleason nines or even when they're on androgen deprivation therapy for these guys, are so committed and they live such an amazing life as you were saying that their intake of not only food but media changes yeah. their 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 tolerance to for bs in the world or relationship everything they just reevaluate their lives it's just beautiful to see men living their best life after a, a diagnosis of prostate cancer. I really love is. it. And, and all the things you're doing, especially for those patients of yours that might be coming into you on androgen deprivation therapy. I mean, talk about, I mean, talk about the emotional hit and the physical hit that that does, you know, it's like, here's the therapy you're trying to take to theoretically save your life. Right. Yet it completely emasculates you at the same time. So a lot of these little hacks that we're talking about today, put that empowerment and put the power back into the patient that they can actually surf that wave so much more elegantly and not lose themselves in the process. And in fact, as you've noted, come back even better than before. Yeah. And, and even guys on ADT who, you know, we, they, they can still feel like you said, masculine, right? Mm -hmm. I just tell them, look, you, you do this, you're going to still feel masculine. The, the ability to perform sexually, it's tough because you know, your beautiful girlfriend or spouse, mm -hmm. She's she looks like a piece of art, like a beautiful piece of art that looks interesting, <laughs> not something that you want to be in intimate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, but be careful with those sad movies. You yeah. you will ball. You'll you'll be bawling <laughs> exactly. in tears, uh, like uh, unlike any other time in your life. So that that will happen. Uh, you know, beautiful moments with your kid and your grandkids or what have you. You will tear more than usual, but that's okay. That that's also masculine. Yeah. Um, so. What are your terrain biomarkers? Yeah, great. So I look at basic things. I want to understand epigenetics. We talked about SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms yep. help guide me to understand. Like for instance, the TMPRSS2, for instance, that's a higher mm -hmm. proclivity towards prostate cancer. Yep. Um, you know, that's just one example that I can kind of tell. And then there's certain markers, like if it's going to be an aggressive prostate cancer, sometimes I see things like MLH1, MSH2, these sort of familial, aggressive, oncogene triggering SNPs can show up there that were just kind of your 
you know, that, so if I get people before they have cancer, then we can like look at that and start to shore them up. But if I get people with cancer, we can say, well, this is why this probably explains some of the, the patterns and helps you also know how to arm yourself to deal, to deal with this differently. So we look at the epigenetics. It also helps me really hone in on what diet's going to be the best fit when, what duration, what combination, um, you know, so for instance, like my, I, I use my husband as a lot of examples here, but he also, he's got the ACSL one snip. So he's the guy when he eats too much meat, his insulin levels go crazy high. So ah. Mr. Gluconeo. So he really does need to stay. He'd love to be a carnivore. He would love it, but he really like for him, the carb lifestyle was so bad. It like everyone in his family has died of diabetes. He had di was diagnosed with diabetes in his thirties. So we know carbs are a problem, but also too much protein in his mm. contribution is a problem. And what's that SNP or genetic acetyl Acetyl-CoA, the SNP, it's a, it's big and mm. how they process some saturated fats in animal meat and animal fat and animal and animal meat, you know, the, the proteins of it. And so yeah. between that and a few others, he has these SNPs that it's like, okay, you really do have to stick closer to a, a moderate to lower protein amount to keep your insulin levels at bay to keep your, to keep that down. But he also can't go crazy on the carbs. So he's got to just really, he does work very well with a high fat, low carb diet. Like that really is his mm. magic. Right. Um, but other people would have different scenarios, different stories. So we look if, it, if it wasn't that you met him such a long time ago, I would say that was a prerequisite for him to Matt, for you to marry him. I would have said, <laughs> well, but I know that you met way before uh, you yeah. even knew any of this information. Yeah, <laughs> you were way vegans. Before. And the crazy thing is he's a mad scientist, biochemist, who's also an epigenetics guru. So we've been learning these things together and it's been teaching us both like our own inner workings and our own, like what makes us tick is, as relation partnership, you know, in marriage partnership in business, but also like in our, just our health evolution, because we both have had a lot of extreme health challenges and have been yeah. able to come over them because we've learned things about our data that helps drive our, what we do differently. And so we apply that methodology to the patient. So the epigenetics give me a lot of information. So does that metabolic health, like that's a key. In fact, 90% of all cancers are very glycolytic in nature, prostate as well, but it also likes some other factors. So we definitely look at insulin, insulin growth factors, C-peptide, hemoglobin A1C, glucose, triglycerides. I think I've covered the basis there. Be it, we look at the body fat index, not the BMI, but we look at the body fat. We you know really check to make sure they don't have the Dunlap, you know, and things like that to look at those things. Is there any home device that you like uh, on the body fat? I've been looking at those. I, and, and again, I'm not looking for so much accuracy, right. just progress. Exactly. But I, I need something. I can't, it can't be 10 points, 10 point difference. You know, a lot, there are a lot of great scales out there now, but you just have to make sure the patients are well hydrated. Because it will also yeah. take that into account. So if I educate a patient of like, you really need to keep your hydration at this level to be able to get a more consistent read, like you said, just not to be accurate or specific, but it's consistent and shows us progress or setbacks. So that's mm -hmm. really key there. I think there's some cool technologies that are coming out this, in the next couple of years that can make these Good. more, I know, I get excited about that. Um, so yeah, because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of patients. So I, I have them yeah. buy several things, right? A tape measure to, to measure their waist to hip ratio, you know, you know scales yeah. um, and things. And I, and I want to recommend a really good scale that, yeah. rec you know, I think that they need to, so the ones that you stand on only sort of measures from the waist down. Right. And then the ones that you hold in your, in a grip, yeah, in your hands yeah. measures from the arms to the waist and the combo and is i'm looking at yeah. the combo yeah, yeah. so i'm looking yeah. at what's best yeah you know without spending thousands of dollars for equipment uh, that i have in my clinic there is one that i like it's around 100 bucks i think on amazon that's the handheld stand-on and it gets a yeah omron has I one think omron, that's is, right yeah yeah I think yeah. that fits. And, yeah. and so that metabolic, that's one of the drops in the, in the mitochondrial bucket is actually, what are you fueling yourself with? So we also take a look at their diet diary, their lifestyle. Like, how do you eat? Do you eat before, do you eat late at night? Do you eat early in the morning? Like, are you eating within sunlight hours? Like what's, do you eat driving down the road? You know, do you go through the drive through? Like, we just want to get a sense of even their patterns of it. Are they eating alone? Are they eating with somebody? Are they multitasking while they're eating? Those things make a difference. Um, and yeah. then are they able to fast? Are they uncomfortable if they go more than four hours without food? Are they they needing a snack before they go to bed? Do they wake up in the middle of the night hungry? Do they have to put something in their mouth the second they get up? Those are all signs of metabolic inflexibility. So we want to really address that. The, the next one is toxicants. I mean, my gosh, we are living on the planet today. It's no doubt that we all have toxicity. How bad is it? And how does it interact with the rest of our terrain, right? And so mm -hmm. um, like my husband loves the smell of diesel. I get a massive headache and super nauseous because I'm missing some glutathione snips. They're completely don't exist for me. So I have to 
take the garbage out myself with my body. I've just sauna. I have to take binders. I got to keep right. everything moving. I got to make sure bowels, breaths, skin, like all that stuff is flowing because my body will store the toxins where other people can deal with it better, you know, than somebody else. So learn about that about yourself and you can get curious. And how do you that. test for that? Well, there's some really cool ones now. I mean, we used to be able to use Great Plains Labs, but they've changed up a little bit. So we've been using, is it Vibrant is one mm -hmm. we've been using. In the Vibrant Labs? Yep. And there's a company out of France that is called Kudzu, like the plant, Kudzu Science, that does things like you can even get a silicon wristband that you t get home, you wear it for a week. So you can even look at the acute exposures in your home. Mm -hmm. They'll measure that. They will also look at skin, or excuse me, hair, urine, and blood, and really look at all the things. And they're a pretty good price point, way cheaper, and they'll ship their kits globally. Um, so you can really assess what's going on with someone's toxic exposures. Um, you can also just have people like look, go through their zip code, ewg.org, right? Look at the zip code of what they're drinking in their water. You can also, there's a couple air pollution some sites that you could put in. You can also go to the environmental, you know, the EPA website and type in for super fun sites, your zip code, and just know what industries you're being exposed to. So people can start to get a good sense. In our intake, we have a huge, this is all kind of learned from Dr. Walter Crinion, one of our teachers in the environmental medicine space that's no longer with us, but he is in many other ways, that I use a kind of a repurposed uh, environmental intake from him. So I do ask people like, do you have a water filter? Um, do you, you know, use dry cleaning? What are your body care products? I mean, do you use plastics? Do you handle plastics on a regular basis, like receipts and whatnot? So those are the things that you start to do an inventory, an audit, right? So I tell people, if you ever have me over for dinner, I'm going to look in your medicine cabinet. I'm going to look under your kitchen sink. I'm going to look in your pantry. I'm going to look in your garage. That's what I do. I start throwing things out, right? Right, right. From like, <laughs> ring, ring, ring. I can walk into somebody's home right away and know if it's toxic. I mean, especially like fragrances. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the new carcinogen. It's the new cigarette smoke. And yeah, you know, that's a tough one. Cult, this cultural, cultural scenarios involved. And, and, and for, for us, it's like, that's a, that's right. one that, you know, is hard to break. Exactly. Uh, and then I test yeah. to see how much of that is in my body um, or, you know, I, I think testing because what happens is, so I, the method and, and my methodology is always changing yeah. and I'm always okay. upgrading yeah. it. Right. Yeah. But I'm one of the thing, main things I focus on is, all right, how do we be, how can we be holistic, but realistic? Exactly. Where do we start? Right. Because right. I, I will not be going to their homes. Yeah. Their homes right. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that. Yeah, yeah. So where do we start? Sure. I mean, some guy, yeah. some guys are coming at zero, yeah. you know, yep. they're, they're coming at zero. So if I tell yep. them 10 things, yep. They're not going to do anything. And I want to set them up yeah. for success. Well, so. one of the things I, you know, in my book itself, I have in the very beginning is a terrain 10 questionnaire and it's very low hanging fruit, very simple. We've actually expanded on it. It's like much more deep that goes into our data platform as well. I can help you get that for the show notes that people can do kind of a self audit there. So out of those 10 yeah. drops in the bucket, so epigenetics, me metabol you know, metabolism, toxicant, microbiome, immune system, inflammation, Circadian, like oxygenation and angiogenesis, so circulation, hormone balance, stress and circadian rhythm, and mental emotional. Those are the 10 drops that are part of the questionnaire. And you can then mm -hmm. do that quick questionnaire and understand what your priorities are. So it might say, mm -hmm. wow, you know, really I scored highest in environmental toxins, stress, and maybe I'm a sugarholic. So those three places. That's where we then can hone in and say, well, let's see if that sugar really is a problem for you. Let's take a look at your insulin. Let's take a look at your A1C. Let's take a look at your insulin growth factor. If they're already cancering, I'm going to look at an IGF-1 in every patient. Then the same thing with toxicants. Like, well, can you kind of do a quick audit around your house? Here's a guide of what that looks like. Can you get a sense of maybe it's time to get rid of the Teflon? Maybe it's time to, you know, switch out to glassware. Maybe it's time mm -hmm. to stop using that particular body shampoo or whatever to make those steps happen. And then if we don't see some significant changes, because many of those are very big endocrine disruptors, which really impact yeah. your community as well as mine. Absolutely. And so that's one. And then like even down to the stressors, like, okay, well, if you've got some extra cash, let's look at maybe HRV technologies for you. Because a lot of guys are like their gadgets, right? They like their data, their wearables. Their, yeah. yeah. The biofeedback of that's really yeah, helpful. I, 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 I'm all, I I'm all it. covered. Well, and I'm all covered. Men with... are drawn to that more than women. And I'm not yeah. trying to be sexist, <laughs> yeah. but I think it's helpful because it, it's true. It's real time data. And it's like, yep, 
that's not working for me or yep, that is working for me. And so, but that's good, but you can also still, like there's a lot of great like stress index, you know, freebie questionnaires and things out there to get a sense of that. Pretty accurate. Yeah. And then like in that stress zone, it's like even getting down to like sleep hygiene that you alluded to, you know, nature Mm -hmm. time, circadian rhythm support. So that's where we start is helping people look at maybe their top two or three priorities and then hone in there. That's the simplest place to start. But when someone already has maybe read my book, taken the thing and say, I'm ready to jump in, we do have a series of onboarding labs. And they're looking at things like your, your metabolic health. They're looking at things like inflammation, angiogenesis hormone, you know, the hormones, not just of like sex hormones, but how the thyroid's interacting, how the adrenals are interacting. Um, You know, we take a look, a deep dive at all of that. So we have this tapestry of who you are. It reveals to us what your patterns are and therefore what your priorities are for the treatment. So that's why I say we're not protocol driven because your, we took 10 of your patients with, you know, metastatic prostate cancer all of them got there for a different, in a different way and all different reasons and all different needs to even take them back to balance. There might be some fundamental commonalities, right? Across the board, but still the nuances, the individuality is what makes this approach shine because the patient is at the center of the equation. So you're going to send me the, the terrain, terrain 10. Yeah, I will. I'll I'll load that up as well. That'd be awesome. I'd love it because I want people to get Nisha. What's that? I want people to get curious about yes. the why, right? Yeah. You know, the why it is, 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 is it's actually very interesting. You know, when you do like a personality type mm-hmm. or something and it's like, oh, mm-hmm. geez, I don't like myself. Yeah, it's like, I wonder if some of that, oh my God, I'm a mess. <laughs> it's like, God, it's like, I'm a, where do I start? But it's important to know, it, it is very important. Part of the, what we do in our practice is, you know, have the patient's get to know themselves. Let me help you. Let me learn about you and how your body and how you work and function biochemically. And let me teach you how your body works biochemically and how we can make the the adjustments to, to really for, for prostate cancer to be an opportunity for you and not a a, a death sentence. I love that Gia. This is why we, this is why we vibe. That's why we vibe. (laughs) Aisha, final words. Thank you so much for being on, by the way, this has been awesome. You know, I've had a few, for a while, I had a lot of MDs on my yeah. podcast, and it's great because these are like leaders in totally, their yeah. space. Totally. And every now and then, I didn't have too many MDs. I had Paul Anderson, Yay. Dr. Paul Anderson, uh, a, a few others. And so you're, 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 you know, you're, you're one of our, one of our own mm-hmm. here talking, uh, you know, integrative approaches. So I thank you so much for being on. Final words from you. Wow. I mean, first of all, one thing I think is so powerful, what you do, what I get to do is we get to help people understand they're far more powerful than they're led to believe. Mm-hmm. And that they have far more, like you, you spoke about this a few times during our talk today, and I just want to really punctuate this, which is cancer is an opportunity, mm-hmm. right? It's an opportunity. And so it's like, you can, you can meet it head on and it can change your life for the better, I promise. And so it's an honor to be here with you, with your tribe. I look forward to hearing what people find when they play with their terrain 10 questionnaire. Um, I look forward to seeing you continue to make a ripple of positive effect in men's lives um, on this planet, because there's not many people doing that. And I'm really grateful to have colleagues like yourself who are out there supporting the divine masculine. So thank you. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for saying that. Nisha, thank you so much. I really hope to see you in person soon. I'm going to look at conferences that you're you're going at and even just be with you and spend some time with you. I'm going to probably attend. Thank you so much, honey. (laughs) All right. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Dr. Geo podcast. You can watch all episodes of this podcast and much more by subscribing to my YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash Gio Espinoza ND. If you love what you heard today, you can help by leaving a five-star review of the podcast on Apple and Spotify, as each review helps us reach more men who are serious about improving their urological health and how to function better with age. And for the latest research and actionable takeaways in the world of men's health, and integrative urology, sign up for my newsletter at drgeo.com. I'll see you next time.